Uh, we next hear from Mr. the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, who is recognized for five minutes. Thank you uh, very much for being here. Thank you, generals, for your service to our nation. Uh, thank you, Director Ray, for your comments earlier regarding law enforcement. It is important that we always remember in, the, in, in all of this that you know they're the ones who, at, at the end of the day, the greatest sound is Velcro coming off. They're the ones whose li lives are in danger each and every day, and so we certainly appreciate and honor their service. Um, Director Ray, I was noting that the absence of the Capitol Police Chief here, again, as others have mentioned, uh, allegedly, because she's too busy to come here today, she has a scheduling service. I, I think it's important for us to understand really how this happens. Uh, some have asked why she's not here today. I, I think it's simply because why have one hearing where we get things done when we can have three hearings? Uh, this whole issue has been politicized from the very beginning. We had Speaker Pelosi lying even about the cause of death of a Capitol officer and including that information into the impeachment hearings as evidence. Uh, we've seen how even the attending physician's office has been politicized as well as we had different mask rules for the Senate as the House. So um, unfortunately these positions that are supposed to be of service to the entire body have been highly politicized under the current leadership and it's important that we get back to actually seeking truth and serving. Uh, the, this, this House and the people that we are elected to serve. Now, Director Ray, you have mentioned that this is not an insurrection. You wouldn't call it that. Uh, why, why is that? What would be the definition of an insurrection? Sure, to be clear, all I'm saying is that uh, for, for us, the use, or for me, in my role, to use the word insurrection, because it has legal meanings, a uh, very specific legal meaning. That's something that I would only want to be doing in coordination with the Justice Department uh, and the prosecutors and charges brought to that effect. So that's really all I'm saying. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with anybody's characterization. I'm just saying that for my role, for what I do, for me to use that word uh, has different uh, implications um, than it might for for your colleagues. I, I understand. It, truly, a, it was heartbreaking day. There's no doubt about it. Heartbreaking day for uh, Americans. Uh, sad to see that happening in our our nation's capital. Republicans have been pretty unanimous in condemning it and calling for those prosecuted to be, or those uh, who broke the law to be prosecuted. You mentioned domestic terrorism, that this would qualify as that with the riots that we saw across the cities for nights and nights and weeks and weeks on, even months on end, qualify as domestic terrorism as well? Uh, we've been treating both as domestic terrorism and investigating both through our joint terrorism task forces. Okay. Have you watched, there's allegedly 14 hours of video. Uh, have you seen the video of the... From January 6th? From January 6th. I've seen lots and lots of the video. I'm not sure that I've seen every second of, of video, but certainly sure. I've seen a lot of video. Um, is there a reason that can't be released to the public? Well, uh, I think as I mentioned in response to one of your colleagues' questions, we have to be very, very careful about ongoing not just investigations, but now a whole bunch of ongoing prosecutions. Well, we've, we've seen that one of the greatest things that has is body cam footage of police incidents is being released, and that's been a calming effect or uh, a way to bring understanding uh, throughout the communities. Don't you think it would be helpful if people were able to see for themselves what, what really happened and make judgments based on that? I, I understand the value of body-worn cameras, certainly, uh, and I understand the value of being able to inform the public, but I also understand the value and the importance and the necessity of protecting the integrity of ongoing criminal cases uh, and the rights of the accused and the very strong feelings of federal judges who manage their own courtrooms and their proceedings. And I learned a long time ago to be very mindful of that, uh, and oh, here we 500, have close 500 to 500 members, of those I, cases. I only have 30 seconds left. 500 members have been charged. Um, I've asked this question before in a previous committee hearing. Had, were any of them members of Congress? 
in connection with January 6th, I do not believe we've charged any member of Congress uh, in connection. With okay, in spite of the speaker uh, trying to convince America that was otherwise. I, I wanted to speak also just about the general corruption of the FBI. We've seen this, the FBI spied on the Trump campaign. We had Crossfire Hurricane, which was basically a taxpayer-funded Russian collusion hoax incubated at the FBI. We've seen FISA abuse. Your 215 authorizations gathered business records expired on March 2020. I sure hope that you're not uh, continuing that practice. Um, we've seen recently the USA Today subpoenas that went out. And what we've seen from the public is a few slaps on the wrist kind of for cover. But really, the FBI seems to be in need of systemic overhaul to rid out corruption. What are you doing? to help ensure that the people in our United States can trust that the FBI is acting in accordance with the law in an unbiased manner. Uh, because sometimes it, it would just seem, when you have a, a, a organization that's been that corrupt working to prosecute people, it, it seems almost like the, the, the pot calling the kettle black, so to speak. So well, are you Congressman, going to help, I, I, help change the culture I, of the I, FBI? I would like to be heard on this subject, uh, Madam Chair, if I would, because this is something that's extremely important to me. Uh, number one, where we have made failings, I've implemented sweeping changes throughout the organization. I've installed an entirely new leadership team, uh, and I've implemented in connection with, for example, the FISA IG report over 40 corrective measures. I could go on and on. But what I would also say is that I disagree strongly, sir, respectfully, but strongly with your characterization of the FBI as corrupt. I will tell you as somebody who has met with law enforcement leaders, chiefs, sheriffs, commissioners in all 50 states and from well over 50 countries, I've visited all 56 FBI field offices, most of them more than once. All 35 are headquarters divisions, a whole bunch of our offices overseas. I've met with judges, I've met with prosecutors. Uh, Director, I, I've I, met with private sit. sector. Excuse me, sir, I would like Your to be heard on expired. this. time has expired, the time has expired. I, call I, I agree the boots on the ground are doing a, a good job. It's, the, that's not where the, the problem is. time has expired. I Thank call you. on... In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat-out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today... Did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets? The riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. 
But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket Constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my Constitution. In the FBI's view... The top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right. And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.